Thank you for joining us for today's message. We believe we can go anywhere in the world from right here in Lamarck, Texas and reach people just like you. If you'd like more information about Abundant Life, please visit ALCC.org. You can also text the number below if you would like to support the church financially. Be ready for a powerful message that's gonna impact your life. Um, I'm gonna talk to you for just a few minutes about faith. We're gonna talk about Abraham for a minute. I I think that that God can say something good out of this. Uh, So Genesis chapter 15 and verse one tonight as we get ready to roll. Um, It says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and he said, do not be afraid, Abram. He said, I am your shield. I'm your great reward. And Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, he said, What can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. So look, Abraham says, and, and I, don't, I don't have the time to, to fully give you all the context in the scripture to read it, but I'm just going to tell you what it says, if that's all right. Abraham at this point uh, is actually just Abram. He's not Abraham yet. And he's sitting in his tent And it says that he's facing the wall of his tent, looking at at the wall of his of his living space, of his tent that he lives in. And he's staring at it close to it. And he begins to call out to God. And he says, God, he says, what are you going to give me? He said, what 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 is this all for? He said, I'm old. I'm getting older. He said, I haven't got any children. I don't have an heir to give anything to. He said, the heir of my house is going to be my servant, Eleazar. He said, man, God, are you going to do anything for me? And God, right before this, had said to him, I am your shield and your great reward. God said, I'm going to protect you, and I'm constantly going to bless you. Abraham said, what good is the blessing if I don't have what I really want? I mean, man, this dude's got a little bit of nerve, right? Abraham, to to go to God like that. And, and he kind of comes at God, and, and it's almost like he's not necessarily questioning God, but he's, he's wondering, God, when are you going to show up? When is the timing going to be right? And, and I think sometimes we, we want to be, again, we want to be so respectful to God, and I'm 100% behind that, but there's sometimes that it's okay to question God. It's okay to say, God, man, look, I'm a real person. This is a real situation. What's going on? Because I do that all the time. I ask God, I'm like, God, what are you doing? I'm like, are you going to do stuff when I'm ready? Are you going to Are you gonna answer my prayers now? Or do I got to wait a little bit longer, right? Like, I don't know if anybody else is like that. But y'all are probably perfect, and you just like, you're like, God, whenever you get to it, go ahead and get to it. But I'm not like that. I'm like, God, let's go. Let's get busy here. We got stuff to do. And Abraham was like that. He's staring at his tent, and he cries out, and he said, God, he said, you're doing nothing for me. He said, you've given me no children, and a servant of my household is going to be the heir. And watch this. And the word of the Lord came to him, and he said, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is of your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And I love this because watch what it says, the very next word. It says, he took him outside. you got to realize Abram was sitting in his tent, staring at the wall of his tent saying, God, are you even there? God, watch this. Do you see what I see? He was screaming at God, God, do you even see what I see? And you know what Abram was looking at? The wall of his tent right in front of his face. So what did God do? God said, no, no, no. He said, this isn't going to work. I've got to get you into a new context. i got to get you into a new perspective. And it said he grabbed him and he took him outside. He brought him outside and he said, look at the stars in the heaven. He said, look at him. Can you count them? Abraham said, no, I can't count them. He said, good. He said, look at the sand on the seashore. Can you count it? He said, no, I can't count it. God said, good. That is what your offspring will be. He said, that's how many heirs you're going to have. That's what your heritage is going to be. Not what you can see, but God said, what I can do. Man, you got to realize in your life, God has a plan for you. God's got a future for you. God's got something so big and so great, but so often we get stuck in our own perspective. We get locked in the box of our own situation, and we forget that God is bigger than what we're facing. God is greater than what's staring us in the face, and we're looking at our tent wall, but God's trying to get us to look outside. God said, no, you've got to see something different. He said, man, God, do you see what I see? And God said, no, 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 no. He said, do you see what I see? God said, you got to start looking at the way I see things. you got to learn in your life. You want to be 100% successful? You want God to, to really be able to do something great for you? You've got to learn that principle. 
you got to learn how to step out of your situation sometimes, how to get a little bit of distance sometimes, and be able to look at your life the way God sees it. you got to begin to change your perspective because I know it's difficult. I know it's tough when, when everything feels like it's crashing in on top of you and it feels like your prayers are not getting answered and it's no, 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 no. I know what that feels like, but I'm telling you, if you can just for a moment take a step back and say, God, I may not understand. I don't get it, but I trust you. I believe that, God, you know best. I believe you can do something for me. If you can do that, I promise you things are going to get better. Because all of us, we all have a voice in the back of our head that's, that's telling our story. Right? you got a voice that's telling your story constantly, that's, that's telling what's going on in your life, where you've been, what you've done, all the things that have happened to you. There's a voice in all of our head. We all have a, I like to call it, we all have a narrator. It's like we have an announcer in our, in our mind and and we have this storyteller in our head that, that tells us all the things that we've done. But you know what? I think that, that some of us have to remember that we have the ability to change the narrator in our life. We have the, the ability to change who talks about us in our own mind and what they say and how they say it. You know, I like to watch golf. I'm, a, I'm a, not a great golfer, but I enjoy watching it. And there's sometimes there's some announcers that I can't handle. I can't stand to listen to them. So I'll mute the television and just watch, but I won't listen to them. I'll listen to something else because I don't like their voice. I like the product, but I don't like the narration. I don't like the announcer. I don't like the voice behind it. Well, look, in your life, I believe the same thing is true. There are some things that you'll be able to do, but your mind is going to try and tell you not to do it. Look, when you're sick in your body, your mind's going to tell you you're, gonna, you're sick and you're going to die. But you've got to change the narrator in your mind. You've got to stop listening sometimes to what your mind says. Because you have the ability to choose what you say. My question is, is your life narrated by your feelings or is your life narrated by your faith? Because you've got the choice. You can either have your life narrated by the feelings that you have, and if you do that, I promise it's going to be tough. It's going to be a difficult life. You're going to have a hard time. Because your feelings are easily adjusted. They're easily hurt. They're easily bruised. But if you can allow your life not to be narrated by your feelings, but by your faith, I'm telling you something great can happen. Abraham was at a point where he had faith, but he was living his life by his feelings. He was locked up into his feelings because, watch, he wanted God to do something that God wasn't ready to do yet. Abraham was getting old. He was getting older. He was 90 when this conversation took place. He was over 100 when he decided that God finally could move for him, and God finally did move for him. But in those years, the Bible says that Abram goes in and he, he sleeps with his wife's servant, Hagar. And they have a baby. So watch, Abram said, God promised me I'd have a child. But Sarah, you're too old, and I'm too old, but I'm going to try it out with your servant and see what happens because she's not too old. And so the Bible says that the servant has a baby. They name him Ishmael, and watch, that was not God's plan. That was not plan A. God had a better plan. God's plan was for Sarah to have a baby, not for Abram, but watch, or not for Hagar, but watch this. Abram had a baby that wasn't God's perfect plan. And so what would we do anytime we make a mistake? Because that was a mistake in his life. Anytime we make a mistake, what does your mind do? What does that narrator in your mind do? It tells you that this mistake is going to follow you forever. And anytime somebody talks about you, that's what they're going to talk about. Anytime somebody thinks about you, that's what they're going to think about. You got a divorce, everybody's always going to know that. You went to prison, everybody's always going to know that. You were addicted to drugs, everybody's always going to know that. Watch, the narrator in the back of your mind wants you to believe that one mistake follows you forever. So watch, in Genesis, Abram made a mistake. It was a mistake. But Paul, in the book of Romans, writes about Abraham. And watch what he writes. He says, that is, as it is written, he says, this is Romans chapter 4, verse 17. He says, I have made you a father of many nations. He says, he is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. And God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Just what we just read. Now watch this. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact. I'm going to say that again. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. 
yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Now watch, this happened thousands of years before Paul wrote that. The thing that he's writing about, Abraham, Sarah, Ishmael, Isaac, all of it, all of that happened thousands of years before Paul wrote it in the book of Romans. And what did the narrator in the back of Abraham's mind tell him? This mistake is going to follow you forever. Yet in reading Paul's account of Abraham's life, I see something missing. He doesn't say anything about Ishmael, doesn't say anything about Hagar, doesn't say anything about the mistake Abraham made. All it talks about is his faith to believe God. Why? Because you get to choose the narrator. Abraham had nothing to do with that. He, he, it wasn't even in the, the story of his life thousands of years later. Watch this. The things that you are worrying about, the things that you're losing sleep over, aren't going to make the cut in your story. I'm going to say that again because there's some of you that have been losing sleep over decisions you made. You've been losing sleep over things that you've done. You've been, you've been freaking out over decisions and stuff that's happened and things from the past that you say, these are going to haunt me forever. But I'm telling you tonight, those things are not going to make the cut in your story. They're going to be left on the cutting room floor because you have the ability to be Get beyond what the enemy is trying to rob you with. Some of the things that you focus on aren't even part of your story. Stuff that we focus on. And I think so often we focus on the little things instead of focusing on the big things. The devil likes us to focus on the minute details, the little mistakes, the small problems that we have made. But watch this. Faith is the ability to change the narrative in our life. Faith is the ability to change the story in your world. But watch, on the road of faith, if we're on a road of faith, there are traps on both sides. There's traps that are easy to fall into. The first trap on one side is denial. It's easy to fall into the trap of denial because, watch, we're people of faith. We believe it. I'm a, I'm a believer, and I'm like, man, faith is the real deal, and I have faith that God can do anything. Just like it said Abraham did, that he was dead, he faced the facts, but he had faith to believe that God could do anything. But watch, denial is not believing that God can't do it. But watch, some people don't exercise their faith because they live in denial. They use their faith as a cop-out to not confront the areas in their life that are messed up. That's awfully quiet when I said that because you're like, man, I don't like to hear that. I don't want to hear nothing about that. Because you got areas in your life, you got issues you're dealing with, but instead of dealing with those issues, you just blanket it with faith. You're like, well, God can take care of that later. But what if God is trying to get you to confront something? But watch, we as people of faith, we like to go around and constantly say, oh, everything's okay. It's all good. You ever said that? When it wasn't all good? I'm guilty of that. I've said that before. I've been sick as a dog, barely can get up out of the bed. Catherine will come in and be like, man, are you okay? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's all good. I'll be all right. No, I'm not all good. I'm miserable. I'm sick. I'm hurting. I'm praying that God's going to heal me. But in the moment, I say, oh, yeah, I'm perfect. I'm good. But I wasn't good. There are people that are going through a divorce. you got problems in your marriage, but you're like, oh, everything's great. But it's not great. You're sick in your body. You're like, everything's great. It's not great. Watch, it's not all good just because you have faith doesn't mean that the, it's the disappearance of stuff that's going on. you got to realize, just because I have faith doesn't mean that my life is perfect. I wish it was. But you can't just blanket everything and say it's all good. What you got to do is you've got to say faith can handle that. you got a divorce going on that's hurting. It's not all good. My faith can handle that. You're sick in your body. It doesn't mean it's all good. My faith can handle it. you got to realize it doesn't just blanket things and make it disappear. Stuff is still hurting. But you got to understand that your faith can handle it no matter what's going on. The starting place of authentic faith is honesty. It's honesty. You've got to honestly look at your life and say, here's what's going on. Here's how I can fix it. Some of us are waiting on God to just magically cancel our debts. 
You got credit card debt. You're waiting on God to just magically cancel all that debt. But what if God is trying to talk to you about discipline, about paying your bills? And you're like, man, God, just cancel my debt. God's like, how about you just start paying your bills on time? Right? Like, you're like, man, God, I need to lose 20 pounds. Just suck the fat out. God's like, stop eating Twinkies. Right? Like, God's trying to give you something practical. He's trying to give you some discipline in your life. He's trying to set you on the right path. But you're believing, God, God, by faith, give me a miracle. God's like, I'm trying to give you a method. Because watch, if you can get it through a method, imagine how much better the miracle can be. But you've got to go through the steps. There are some things in our life we've got to just face the facts. I love that it said Abraham faced the facts. He didn't just say, oh, man, everything's cool. I'm 100 years old. I can do anything. No. He was like, I'm old. My wife is old. We're both broken. This isn't going to happen without God. He faced the facts. It's okay to look at your life and face the facts. I say, this is what's wrong, this is what's wrong, this is what's wrong. But watch, I don't focus on the wrong. I focus because it didn't say he faced the facts and was like, well, too bad. It's not going to work. What do you do? He faced the facts and he said, but God is able to do anything. And that's the attitude you've got to have. Yes, stuff is going on, but my God is bigger. Do I have cancer? Yes, but my God is bigger than cancer. My God is bigger than divorce. My God is bigger than brokenness. My God is bigger than depression. You can face the facts and still get a miracle. But watch, you can't get over what you don't own. You can't just expect God's going to just wipe everything out of your life. There are some things you've got to own up to it. Say, this is what I'm dealing with. God, let's get to work. And then put forth the effort to work with God. You can have all the faith in the world, but what does James say? Faith without works is dead. You've got to go to work. You've got to do something. So you got denial on the one side. They say, hey, man, it's all right. Everything's cool. No, it's not. Stop that. Work with it. Work with the faith that God has given you. So you got denial on the one side that says it can't be done. And then on the other side of faith, you've got despair. And despair says that it won't be done. So you got denial that says it can't be done. you got despair that says it won't be done. And faith is what's standing in the middle. And faith is trusting God. You got to spare this and not. It'll never happen for you because of what you are and who you've been. That's that narrator in the back of your mind trying to tell you about your life. You got to tell him to shut up sometimes. It's not his job to tell you. It's your job to tell him. Unless you got a girl in the back of your head and then it's, it's her, you know. I don't know what your narrator sounds like, but mine's British. Um, I wanted it to be, I, I, might have, I might switch that out and make my narrator start talking in, in a German accent. Because, man, anytime Ingolf gets over here, I'm like, man, I feel like I'm in a James Bond movie. <laughs> and, like, I got Christoph Waltz in front of me, and I'm like, man, let's go. Uh, so my narrator, just I'm just going to put you in the back of my head and let you narrate the rest of my life. I love it. I, I can sit and listen to him all day. Um, but watch, whatever narrator you got, you get to choose what they say and how they say it. I'm not talking about accents. Like, that's silly. But, I mean, maybe. But watch, we're talking about faith. What is faith? Faith, you know, I love it, man. When Jesus described it, they said, <coughs> he said, man, the kingdom of God, faith, the kingdom of God working in your life. He said, man, you want to know what the kingdom of God is like? He was like, man, I'm going to tell you what the kingdom of God. In Mark chapter 4, he said, the kingdom of God, the faith that we believe that God can do anything, that kingdom that's living inside of us, that we're going to live inside of, watch, the kingdom of God, he says, is like a giant skyscraper, and it's powerful, and it's strong, and anything you want it to be, it can be. Oh, wait, he doesn't say that, right? I wish he did. I wish God was like, man, the faith that you live in, the faith for the kingdom is, is just powerful. And it's like, a, it's like Mike Tyson in his prime standing in front of you. No, it doesn't say. What does it say? The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Like not a skyscraper. A itty bitty baby. Look at this. I had to get a package of these, and I wasn't going to put them in my pocket because I'm never going to get them out. You, I, I can barely see these seeds, but I promise you, I'm, I'm going to just look. I, I've got one on my fingertip. You can't see it. You can't see it. If they could zoom that camera in as tight as they could. You'll never be able to see it. It's too small. It is the tiniest little seed. There's smaller seeds now, but back then they didn't have smaller. This is the small seed that they talked about. So Jesus was talking. He said, the kingdom of God, what's it like? It's like the smallest seed in the world. It's the smallest of all seeds on earth, yet when it's planted, it grows, 
and becomes the largest of garden plants with such big branches that birds can perch on its shade. Watch this. I, I got a picture of this seed because I wanted to show you what the seed looked like, right? So they're going to they're gonna show. There's the seed, right? Like that's, that's the seed, right? Oh, no, no, no. Well, I mean, you see the tree, but I see the seed. Because that tree had to come from what? That tree had to come from this seed. Look, you're looking, you're looking at, at the tree and you see how big it is and how mighty it is and how great it is and how big its branches are. And you see how beautiful and majestic it is. But you've got to understand that that tree came from this itty-bitty tiny seed that you can't even see where you're sitting because it's so small. And I could drop it and you'd never see it again. But watch, I've got a pocket full of trees. You say, no, you got a pocket full of seeds. No, 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 I don't see it like that. I've got a pocket full of trees. Because watch, every tree starts with a seed. Your faith is a seed. It's something that's so great living on the inside of you. It's so powerful. It's small. But watch, there's potential in it. I'm going to say that again. Because it's small, but there's potential. You look at that tree and you say, man, where did that tree start? I wonder if somebody just transplanted it and it was already a tree. No, it was a seed that big. The smallest seed you can imagine. Watch, it's so tiny, but it had all the potential living on the inside of it. There have been people in your life who have been judging you, people in your life who have been talking about you, people in your life who have been discounting who you are, what you're able to do, everything about your life. They've been thinking that you're nothing and nobody. Watch, because they look at you as a tree, but they don't realize you're not a tree yet. You're just a seed. You're just a seed. You've got all the potential living on the inside of you. There's healing in your mouth. There's potential in your life. God says, I have put something bigger on the inside of you than you even realize, than you even fully understand. You don't get it yet how great you are on the inside. Because if you got it, you'd never put your head down. You'd never be disappointed. You'd never be hurt or broken because you've got to realize the God that created the heavens and the earth, that God has put something great inside of you. Don't judge the seed. Or actually, don't judge the tree by the size of the seed. Because, man, we love to look at that seed and say, oh, man, that seed's probably going to grow like a little flower like that. It's probably going to grow. No, it grows that tree that you can stand under. I had a picture of a guy standing under. It's like five times taller than the guy out of that seed. Look, that's who you are. That's what God has done in your life. You might think, man, I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing, I'm from nothing. No, you don't realize yet the power, the potential living inside of the seed. Can you see the tree in the seed? You see, the older we get, the harder it is. The harder it is to see the potential. The harder it is to see the greatness. But I don't know about you, but if you've got children, when you looked at that first that first look at your baby when, when they were laying in your arms and you're staring down at that child, I don't know about you, but I saw the potential. My baby couldn't do anything, barely open and close her eyes when she was born. She couldn't roll over. She couldn't talk, couldn't walk. I had to change her diapers. I had to do everything for her. But I saw the potential that someday she was going to be great. Someday something good was going to happen in her life. And I spoke that into her because if nobody else will, I will. I spoke it into my boys. I speak it into my marriage. Because watch where the enemy will tell you that narrator sometimes in the back of your head will tell you that you're nothing, you're nobody, you're never going to do anything. No, you got to shut that voice up and begin to correct it. That, man, you don't know who I am. You don't know where I came from. You don't know what's on the inside of me. Can you see the hope of the world in a barren womb? That's what Abraham had to do. Can you see the hope of humanity in a womb? Can you see, my question is, can you see happiness in, in a broken relationship? Can you see the blessing of the person that's left your life? Because I know when they left, it hurt. But what if it's going to lead to a blessing? What if they weren't helping you, but they were hurting you? Can you see something different? It may seem small. I love this because it's what Jesus said. He said, it's a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet, when planted, it grows. I like that. I said, man, it's the smallest seed around, but when it's planted, yet when planted, 
it grows. There was a boy that had five loaves of bread and two fish. It was nothing. It was a small meal. Well, they had 5,000 mouths to feed. It was nothing. Five loaves and two fish can't feed five people. But what happened? It got planted. It was small. Yet when planted, it grows. Yet when planted, it grows. David was a nobody. He was a shepherd boy living in his father's fields and everything looked like it was nothing, yet he was planted in the field. Yet when planted, it grew. He, he was planted in adversity and he began to grow and out came a king out of a shepherd boy. Yet when planted, it doesn't seem big enough. It doesn't seem great enough. Your life may not seem so great, yet when you're planted, you're going to grow. You're going to grow and great things are going to happen. Yet when planted, you got to plant those seeds of purpose on the inside of you. Plant the seeds of, of destiny. Joseph looked like he was planted in a pit. He looked like he was buried in a ditch. He looked like he was, he was thrown into a prison. But no, he was planted in a pit. He was planted in Potiphar's house. He was planted in Pharaoh's prison. Why? Because he was growing every single time. That pretty soon he took over the entire nation. Nobody had as much power as Joseph did outside of Pharaoh himself. Yet, when planted, it grows. Watch this. Your faith is not defined by your weakest moment. Your faith is not defined by your weakest moment. That's what the enemy, that's what that narrator wants you to think, that every decision you've made, every bad decision, that's where your faith is defined. And, and you're never going to have enough. You're never going to make it. But your faith is not defined. Because watch, I'm going to give you one more thing on this narrator thing because I'm thinking about it. You see, we like to believe that we narrate our own life, but I don't believe that. Because you see, there's first person narration and there's third person narration, right? First person narration, watch this, is the person that it's happening to, they're the one telling the story. Third party narration means somebody from the outside looking in is telling the story. Now you like to believe that your life is narrated by you, the first person, it's not. Because watch this, the first person that it happens to, things are happening to you, and so you're narrating your own life. That's not the way it works. Why? Because if that's the way it works, you would look at your life and you would say, it is what it is. How many times have we said that? It is what it is. I'm broke. It is what it is. I'm sick. It is what it is. I'm going through a divorce. It is what it is. My marriage is miserable. It is what it is. My kids hate me. It is what it is. I can't get by. I'm depressed. I'm broken. I'm hurting. It is what it is. Why? Because if it's happening to you, if you're first person saying it, then it's happening and it is what it is. But watch this. When you have a third party, a third party looking in and, and watch this, not just a third party, but an omniscient third party, a third party that doesn't just see where you are, but they've seen where you started. They've seen where you've ended and they're looking at your life. They look at your life and they say it is what it is, but it's not what it seems. That's a word for somebody tonight. Because watch, it is what it is. Abraham was old. He was broken. He was messed up on the inside. Watch, it is what it is. He faced the facts. He said, I can't do this without God. It is what it is, but it's not what it seems. God said, you may be hurting. You may feel depression right now. Your marriage may be hurting right now. You may be sick in your body right now. That is what it is, but it's not what it seems because it doesn't have to stay that way. It doesn't have to be that way. God says, I am greater than what's coming against you. I'm stronger than that divorce. I'm stronger than that hurt. I'm stronger than the brokenness. I'm better than the sickness that's attacking your life. It is what it is, but it's not what it seems. You've got denial as a trap on one side. You've got despair as a trap on the other. Put your faith in the middle. Watch this. It brings you towards destiny. You want to have life and life to the fullest. You want to not just live on earth, but watch, have heaven on earth. You've got to stand in that middle ground. You've got to refuse to be living in despair. You've got to refuse to live in denial. You've got to refuse to believe that you're a nothing. It doesn't matter what you have now. It doesn't matter where you came from. Anything can happen. All things can change. In an instant, it can all turn around. 
You never know what decision is going to be the one that makes everything right. You never know which choice is going to be the one that turns a lifetime of bad decisions around. You never know which one is going to be the one. But you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start that path towards destiny somewhere. Watch this. What you're in today is not the end. It's just a transition. I'm going to say that again because maybe there's somebody right now that's in a moment of despair. You're in a place of hurt. You're in a place of denial. You're, you feel like, man, I'm in a hurting place right now. But I'm telling you tonight that where you are right now, it's not the end. It's just a period of transition. Jesus was talking to his disciples. He said, man, you don't understand. He said, I'm going to be buried in the ground. And they were like, that's terrible. You're going to be in the ground. He said, no, 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 you don't get it. He said, in order for me to live on the other side, I've got to be planted in the ground. You've got to become a seed. Watch this. He said, it's not a burial. It's potential. Because that seed will never do what it's supposed to do until it gets put in the ground. And watch your life. You've got to let your life get put in the ground that God has put you in. And I'm not talking, I mean, this is, a, this is a great join the church, church membership message. But that's not what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about wherever God has put you, wherever he's placed you, get planted where God has put you. If God has put you in this church, get planted in this church. Don't just show up and leave. Show up and become something in this church. Let God use you. Let him lose. You let him use your skills and your talents. Let him take you from where you are to where he wants you to be. Look, it doesn't matter what's gone on in your life. It doesn't matter what that narrator has said. You have the ability to change that voice. Because watch, it's not you that's speaking anymore. It's no longer, man, it is what it is. No, 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 no. From this moment on, it is what it is, but it's not what it seems. Man, I may be hurting, but God has got something better. I may be sick, but God is a healer. I may be broken, but God has put me back together. I may be messed up, but thank God I don't have to stay messed up. I don't know what you got going, but I'm telling you, God knows. And God's ready to do something for you. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you with your daily walk in Christ.